my uh, pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, um, Dr. Tom Neakley, who is Associate Professor of the Department of Geography at the University of Wyoming. He has a PhD uh, and a master's uh, from the University of Oregon, Eugene, and he has two bachelor's degrees from Arizona, one from the University of Arizona, the other from the University of Northern Arizona. His specialties are biogeography, conservation, paleoecology, colonology, bioecology, natural environments of the American West. And his uh, research focus, uh, both sides maybe, are uh, the water-stressed western region of North America, which we all happen to live in. And uh, his projects are aligned with conservation, conservation issues of the West, the capacity of the ecosystems of the West to support the stresses <coughs> that we all put on them. So, and his perspectives come from the study of long-term history of the ecosystem spanning thousands of years. And uh, as we talked about beforehand, you know, long-term is a matter of perspective. And uh, uh, you know, for, for Tom, thousands of years is, is a long time. <laughs> We have had Ron Frost out here, and if it's not, if you're not talking billions, then it's, it's not long. But it's, it's all a matter of perspective. So without further ado, it's my pleasure, and I'd ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Tom Minkley. Tom? students are amazed at that. Uh, I think I've driven through once, um, but I mostly work down in the Colorado Basin and southern Arizona. Uh, my field area is Wyoming through Arizona and northern Mexico, but um, and uh, I'm strangely nervous. I actually, I do have two, I'm going to tell some jokes and burn some energy. I did design this uh, because of the geologist of Jackson Hole. Um, so I have some geology jokes, so, you know, so, so maybe 20 of you will uh, appreciate those or not. Um, but my first degree was telecommunications, audio production, direction, art history, minor. Uh, my second bachelor's is ecology, evolutionary biology, uh, and I started working in the geology department and palynology. But I've always been interested in uh, arid systems. And John Wesley Powell is it's sort of the... Um, originator of caring about arid systems, especially as we look into the West. Um, we're coming into the sesquicentennial, I nailed it, uh, Colorado, uh, of John Wesley Powell's first exploration of the, uh, of the Colorado system from Green River, Wyoming, down to the Virgin Rivers, uh, a Virgin River in Utah. And this was a momentous occasion in um, exploration toward the United States. And Wyoming has a major role in that because we have the railroad. And so as we look at the 150th anniversary of what John Wesley Powell initially did, um, we initiated a project. Um, one of my dumb ideas is that we ought to re-examine where we are with arid lands and water resources in the West. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is really um, demythifying aspects of John Wesley Powell. Um, after talking to some of you, I wish I had more river rafting photos uh, because that's one narrative of this man. Um, but the other was, he was a really, really, really good bureaucrat. Um, if we had more people in Washington like John Wesley Powell, we would get much less done because he was very <laughs> systematic in how he would approach everything. And the history of the West would not be what it is without his actions and um, ability to work within the Washington, D.C. system in an effective way. Uh, I've gotten to know him a lot better over uh, the last two years when we started this project. Um, we have a website. Uh, check it out. Um, I have a student who's tracking traffic, so if you give us a lot of hits, he'll be really impressed with my talk. <laughs> uh, I have stickers for the Department of Geography. We have one of the coolest logos um, oh. Continental oh. Joe. Uh, so put it on your uh, car, proudly display it. Uh, I was going to bring hats, but if you really want to have, we're getting a new order, and um, I'm sure the Geography Club would sell it to you. Um, everything's NPR this week. 
So uh, what I'd like to talk about is a little bit about the place and legacy of John Wesley Powell, as I already um, mentioned. Uh, looking into the future, um, our project is Scree, because it's sesquicentennial, it's really hard to say, um, and Colorado River Exploring Expedition, because John Wesley Powell was terrible at naming things interesting, uh, other than like Wolkenstrand. Actually, his name was great. I shouldn't criticize him yet. Um, and then one of the things that uh, we learned, uh, Alexander von Humboldt, when he was invited to talk to Jefferson after Lewis and Clark uh, made their first exploration of the West, um, Humboldt criticized Jefferson for not sending an artist on that first expedition. And every subsequent expedition into the West has had an art, um, because that's actually how we sold this place. Um, and so I want to, uh, we have some pamphlets for the art uh, uh, portion of this project. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to some of the artists that are working with us uh, for the 150th anniversary. Um, Wyoming and the Settlement of the West. This is, um, I like Alexander von Humboldt. And coming from Arizona, I always like the idea that there's this unknown. And in geography, we love unknown. So if somebody's like, well, you can't do that, and I'm like, oh, let's check that out. Why not? But this is <coughs> one of the first maps of the West um, from Alexander von Humboldt while he was working in uh, Mexico City prior to coming uh, over to talk to Jefferson. And here's the Colorado River. This is what was known, uh, 1811. Um, Humboldt gives us these cartographic features. The uh, hatching of mountains was uh, one of his creations. And we had pretty good knowledge of California, and there was a mountain range. There was something, uh, there was probably a river. Uh, there was the Gila River, and we knew about Santa Fe. I cropped this just to kind of focus on our uh, area of interest. Um, railroads did another great thing, was they, we started mapping. and. Um, so John Wesley Powell is not the originator of mapping of the West, but uh, he was very systematic in what he did. And so we get this across the continent, this manifest destiny view, the railroads coming through, and the, the U.S. government um, sent a number of surveys out to just sort of look at the resources, mineral resources, um, water resources, and routes. Uh, the reason that the railroad runs through southern Wyoming is because there were springs and coal. Uh, those two really good things for moving a train. Uh, Rock Springs. Even Laramie, uh, Spring Creek in Laramie was the watering source. It wasn't necessarily the Laramie River. And so uh, that puts us in line for what Powell needed to do, which was get his expedition started. So we have you know, these, in these artistic expressions of the nothingness, the great unknown out west, and civilization, um, and that civilization, that agrarian value is really what you know we were going to settle um, the region with. And so it's really interesting because you know 160 acres, the Homestead Act, gets you a woodlot, stream access, and the ability to grow your own food. And that's how we were going to settle America. The West was this opportunity because the cities were too crowded. And we were going to send too many, two million people, or you know, ten million people out of the cities. <coughs> and Stegner talks about this beyond the hundredth meridian, um, that not many people succeeded when they uh, moved out here. Um, uh, it was actually a lot harder on 160 acres than everybody but Powell seemed to understand. <laughs> For the geologists, the other thing that Powell did, he was the second director of the USGS. And so if you went to field camp, um, you remember having to hand draw maps, and there was a color code that you have to memorize. You were pit graph pens and your color set. Is everybody, anybody? Sure. So I'm an ecologist, and I was terrible at this because I used the pencil too hard, and so I, my friends would not let me color their maps because <laughs> I was not good enough. Second degree, ecology, evolutionary biology, I focused on plants. Basically, my two bachelor's degree are cocktail party winners. I can do some light art stuff, I can talk, and I can tell you what the food's about. <laughs> Hayden Expedition, uh, he's the one who worked in Yellowstone, 
Uh, here's Wyoming, Idaho in place. Uh, the color scheme, um, the American color um, standard was determined by John Wilson Powell. So if you're thinking about how does he affect your life, one, we're out west, so that's awesome. Two, if you had to color maps, it was his color scheme. There was going to be an international, um, there was an international meeting. Uh, he was going to send, uh, I can't remember which one of his assistants over there, but then he decided that quaternary is yellow. Uh, I work in the quaternary, so that's the only color that matters as far as my research. I know for some of you that's just overburden, uh, but that is, um, there's a lot of good data there. And it's, you know, prehistoric. Historic for me is tree rings. You can count every year. Tree rings. Tree rings. Um, as I said, you know, uh, the Hayden expedition, um, Hayden was working in uh, the Yellowstone region, and he's the one who brought Moran in. Um, and this is the famous uh, painting by Thomas Moran uh, based on his work with the Hayden expedition. Congress paid $10,000 for this and made Moran famous. Um, so all of a sudden, he became the artist du jour. Uh, the other artist out at this time um, was Bierstadt. Uh, both of them were foreigners, but Bierstadt was more German. Nobody could understand him, and he was a better painter. And, he's, and, and he actually cost twice as much. Um, so Moran, you know, he sells this to Congress, and Powell really wanted him to work on the Grand Canyon system. 1869, Powell runs his first, oh, that's probably the next slide, I don't want to get ahead of my story. Um, but Hayden um, starts this idea that we're selling the West through visualizations. And the public bought into it. And this is one of the reasons that we get the first national park. So Powell, 150 years on, what was his deal? He was a <coughs> Civil War veteran. Um, he knew about the upper, uh, upper river section of the Green. The Colorado River, technically, the Green River is the headwaters. Uh, Colorado did some politicking. It was called the Grand River in Powell's day. Um, Colorado made it to Colorado, and they made the headwaters in Colorado. That was some serious uh, political power. Denver was really uh, strong at that point. But what he accomplished was, it's always talked about the great unknown. Um, and so he was the first Westerner to connect the river. We didn't know how the Green River system connected to Black Canyon near uh, where um, Vegas is now. Ives had run a steamship, uh, a, a steamboat upriver, and so we knew it was navigable, so that makes it U.S. waters. But we never really got black, past Black Canyon. They hit some rocks, things went bad, and so there was this giant chunk of river that was unknown. Mountain men had run down the Green River, Ashley Falls, everything under Flaming Gorge Dam. Um, that was the initial gorge of the entire uh, system. So uh, Powell had an idea of where, uh, at least what was going on in the upper section, but his real accomplishment on that first expedition is they lived. And that's huge. The, when they got out at the bottom, the, um, they were seining for boat parts and any evidence for the Powell expedition. And they come around the corner and like, hey, what's happening? <coughs> sure, it wasn't that kind of formal conversation, but yeah, they're like, hey, we're really hungry. We just sold some melons upstream from some Native American farm. And that was really yummy, or do you have food? And so, because they were on flour and coffee at that point. But by surviving, he did a great thing, and this is where we have this dichotomy of um, how we might understand John Wesley Powell, depending on which direction or what storyline you want to follow. You have the great explorer. They didn't run all the rapids. He's, and you read the second expedition, he really was unhappy when they got dumped on it, you know, the river jargon, but they just, they tanked. And they got sucked, you know, the one-armed man gets sucked off the boat, and they're in a whirlpool, Big Eddie, and he was down for a couple seconds and not too happy about that. He did not necessarily like river running. 
uh, first myth broken. Um, but it was a means to the end. The yeah, end of the means, he wanted to understand the space. Um, and they actually pulled out, they didn't do the entire second expedition all the way to the Virgin River. They uh, pulled out Kanab and then walked out. Um, because they had gotten their research done. They were mapping by the second expedition. But by surviving, he became the last of the lower 48 great explorers. And he used that to become, and, and he was writing popular literature, and then he was writing scientific literature. And the scientific literature we know would be quite boring and very bureaucratic, and the popular literature is like, this guy is an American <coughs> hero. One arm pulls this whole thing off. Uh, you know, we're, we're joking as we're building this project about you know, how awesome it would be to have been pal because all of the men aren't running rapids either, they're portaging. And so they're carrying 2,000 pounds worth of gear and Powell's like, well, I'm gonna go for a hike. <laughs> Which anybody who's run a field crew knows that that's what you get to do when you're running the field crew. It doesn't matter if you have both arms or not, you get to go for a walk. <laughs> I try to help sometimes. <laughs> the thing is that he generated a ton of literature. Um, this is uh, the, we're working on a book, Vision in Place, uh, Reimagination of the West from John Russell Powell. This is the um, desk of one of my co-editors. And he was just showing me his stack of books. I said, you, you really ought to take a picture of that for me. But this is, this of all of this work, uh, build, uh, this is Worcester's uh, River Running West, great book, Seeing Things Whole, Bill Du Bois. Um, this is the only one that's really written by Powell, is The Arid Lands. The Great Unknown is a really fun read. Um, that's the uh, diary, the illegal diaries of everybody else. Um, and then there's all this <coughs> literature about the expedition, about that first run. Or that first and second run hybridized into that first run. You know, um, you know there's some criticisms there. You know, uh, Stegner's book, Beyond the Hundredth Meridian, is about the arid lands. <coughs> it's really about this book, but it's also about making Powell a hero. Unlike other great explorers, Powell didn't have the advocates of his time. Custer's wife really promoted Custer being an American hero. Powell's wife was like, I am done with that guy. <laughs> All he talks about is there's no water out west. Uh, okay. So, so he didn't have an advocate until Stegner. And that's really interesting given the importance of this man's work uh, to where we are now. Um, so that didn't come out great, but here's the... Um, this color scheme, I've already mentioned this, but we have the American color scheme, and this is Wyoming, and uh, Powell's Technicolor uh, Lava Lamp View. Um, it's quite colorful. We have some great geology here, as you know. And somebody had to color all of that by hand at one point. Um, again, I think I've already, my joke's alone, but uh, this is the Green River, uh, uh, Powell's work, and this is his second, this is coming off of his second um, expedition, when they really started mapping the West. So one of, another thing um, in the, uh, uh, when I was interviewed about this talk, you know, it's like, why do I care about Powell? And one of the things that I would argue is that if you like Google Maps, you should like John Leslie Powell. Because one of the things that he wanted to do, his first job, well actually why he got to be the second, inter second director of USGS, it was all about mapping. He wanted to map the West. We need to map the resources. We need to map the water. Um, if you're hard rock geology, he didn't worry about you because all that's up in the mountains and that's not where people are going to settle. What he wanted to do is create the agrarian society and make people succeed on the landscape of the West. And he knew that that was going to be done through water. So this, it was a big effort of a lot of the expeditions coming out West 
Powell said, let's have a standardized color code, but his interest wasn't necessarily in the hard rock geology or the resources other than water. And we still are worried about that today. So, as he became this bureaucrat, <coughs> one of the things he wanted to do, we wouldn't have state boundaries, the cartographic boundaries of lines and you know, arbitrary uh, ruler marks. He wanted the West to be mapped out through hydrologic units. And so, if you were, if you were the top of the watershed, say, Wyoming were the top of three of the major rivers, right? Columbia, they get the Snake, Missouri, uh, Colorado. So, yeah, those are big rivers. We would be first in priority to use that water. Now, we're not going to have the same agricultural um, output that you might have in a warmer climate, but Powell was um, very interested in dewatering the rivers. The water should not be in the native channel. So, uh, his first idea, control the headwaters. That was super unpopular because we already had mining going on. And the miners were like, well, we've been using this water and um, yeah, that's not fair because we want to be able to continue our activities. So after that, he was like, well, if we can't control the waters in my first plan, and this, and this first plan was where this whole project for me started, it was like, well, let's run NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act, and ESA on Powell's idea and see how that goes down. Because I, you know, um, I thought that would be fun. Um, <laughs> but Powell lost that argument and so did I. Um, so we're not dealing with the headwaters. We already have people out here, we're already using the waters. His second thought was, well, if we're not going to do a, manage, uh, a logical, systematic management of the waters and getting water out of the river channel onto soil or into the sky. Those are the, those are the places that water should go. The government should be involved in the development of Western waters. And so um, we see that manifest. This is uh, the uh, degradation of rivers or the uh, degree of alteration of rivers um, focused on Wyoming. The Colorado River, you can see that there's 40 to 100% uh, alteration of portions of the river systems based around the major dams. There are um, thousands of dams, little we'll check dams. Everything counts as far as a dam. Um, Powell's idea was the government should develop this water. This is the government's obligation to the people. And in doing so, we create irrigation ditches, we get it to feeding people, and the native channels would be dry. So if you're a river runner, that means that there's no water in the Grand Canyon. That would be Powell's idea. As I, I hope I mentioned, um, a lot of my mythology of Powell has been debunked in this project. And so I'm, I, and I'm told I'm kind of depressing when I lecture. <laughs> He loved what the Mormons did, and that's what he was arguing for in the initial plan. Between the, the Asietas in uh, New Mexico and the Mormons, he really saw that as the agra agrarian ideal. Um, and that's where his plans uh, really uh, started forming for the air plans. So, he accomplished his goal in, 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 in this idea that channels should be dry. The government should do things for the public. Powell, um, ultimately, we are living in his hydrologic world at this point. Uh, Hoover Dam was this first accomplishment. This is a great photo of it. This is actually the artist's depiction of what the Hoover Dam uh, would inundate the reservoir area, native, and this is in Black Canyon, so Vegas is over here. Um, his nephew, Arthur Powell Davis, was the first director of the Bureau of Reclamation. Now, I'm a, 
I'm the son of a scientist, and so I know how much knowledge can be transferred um, in the living room. <laughs> uh, and when you read Arthur Powell Davis's writings about the placement of the Hoover Dam, and you read a lot of Powell stuff, you don't don't burn yourself, but it, it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, you can actually see sentence for sentence transfers wow. for the Bureau of Reclamation coming from Powell's ideas. This took another 30, 40 years, but things move slow in the West, and especially water development and uh, something large like the you know, creation of, at the time, one of the largest dams. So we are living in his hydrologic uh, vision out here. Um, the interesting thing, uh, so this uh, Hoover Dam closes in um, 33, the gates close. Um, nobody contested it. Um, it was considered to be a good thing for the United States. Um, it does lead to a sacrificial landscape under Lake Mead. I've never heard anybody say that we need to drain Lake Mead to uh, resurrect. We don't know what cultural resources are under Lake Mead. It was completely not contested. This was America um, at its finest at one of its darkest moments. Um, and, you know, this project also is critical to the $5 billion agricultural industry in Yuma and in the Imperial Valley. This was designed for the Imperial Valley. So we often get these ideas that, uh, you know, uh, Arizona's taking Wyoming's water, but if you have microgreens for lunch today, it's coming out of Yuma. Um, this is incredibly important to the uh, food supply uh, at present. So Powell's vision is manifest in this one project. Of course, we know the history of the West is that we went a little good or bad. We went a little crazy with dam building. Because once the Bureau of Reclamation, Bureau of Reclamation is to reclaim the desert. That is what reclamation means, is that we make non-productive land um, productive. And it's really interesting because my students are now talking about reclamation, but they don't mean reclamation. They mean restoration of you know, what we're contested landscape. So we have Yuma and Imperial Valley, important economic engines. California has a $35 billion agricultural industry. Wyoming has a $0.5 billion agricultural industry. If we're talking about using water, we, you know, we probably ought to compare apples to almonds. Um, <laughs> thank you. I'm glad you got that one. That's awesome. <laughs> um, the next thing that happened, though, is like I said, we, we kind of went nuts with dam building. Anchor Dam in Wyoming is one of these great boondoggles that doesn't hold any water. They didn't do the geology right. And um, if you want to ever see a cool dam that isn't doing anything, go out by Thermopolis and check out Anchor Dam. Um, it has sinkholes all over the place. It's uh, super fascinating. But um, we get to Powell's vision. If we were strictly managing the Colorado River Basin in a John Wesley Powell view um, for agriculture. We know the obligation that uh, the river, the upper basin, have to the lower basin. And we could satisfy our obligation to lower basin states, and this is strictly management, no ecological flows. 10,000 cubic feet per second coming out of Glen Canyon Dam will give the lower basins all the water we're obligated to give them in 328 days. John Wesley Powell and Arthur uh, Powell Davis didn't think Mexico should get any water. Um, uh, the law disagreed. It takes 76 days to give Mexico a 10,000 CFS. So if you've ever run through the Grand Canyon, um, 10,000 CFS is pretty exhilarating. It's not 17,000, um, you know, and it's a little bit rocky uh, for those of us who run rivers. Um, but the thing about resource management and resource development is that we do get changing values. And so the construction of Glen Canyon Dam um, is a reflection on changing values. 
David Brower, this is a famous story, David Brower and the Sierra Club, they ran through Echo Park and they, protect, they said that this is such a valuable landscape that we must save it from this rampant dam building. In the Sierra Club, the, you know, the Bureau of Reclamation had their calculations for water loss. Um, they were fudging their numbers, let's say, and uh, um, the Sierra Club starts running a lot of people through that section of river. We get people in New York very vested in a Dinosaur National Monument, and so we stop that dam. Um, Ed, Abby wrote a lot about this, Desert Solitaire. Um, we get a different environmental ethic. This is the early 60s. And we're now talking about, as opposed to sacrificial landscapes, like what we have under Lake Mead, contested landscapes. If we're going to do these developments, where are we going to do them? And there's a lot of um, concern. Uh, this is uh, Desolation Gray, a uh, great section of river. Um, Cottonwood riparian corridor there, just completely awesome. We swapped Echo Park for Glen Canyon. And uh, everybody said, well, I didn't know what we were doing. And apparently Glen Canyon down, or Glen Canyon was just beautiful. It's relatively flat water. Um, you know, Katie Lee talks, uh, sang about it. Yeah. Uh, every, uh, she just passed away. Um, God bless Katie Lee. Um, at the last time I gave this talk, actually there was a whole tribute to her, it was really uh, touching. Um, but we know that we lost something very special in Echo, uh, in this trade. Um, the other thing that happened, um, this is my dad, that's my uncle, that's a big fish, um, <laughs> is that we have the, we also started changing um, our values and we get the, um, this concern about endangered fish. So, Brower and Abby are concerned about the landscape, the terrestrial sphere. But then uh, we started, uh, we had Silent Spring uh, happen, and Wyoming has a role to play in this story um, in that we, in the 62, uh, Flaming Gorge Dam is going in, and believe it or not, Wyoming, uh, this is my narrative, uh, my, my talk, so I get to do these things. Um, we poisoned the Upper Green River because we wanted to stock it for sport fish. Relatively famous. So we had just had this battle for Echo Park. And we have a national monument. And now there's rules in how things can happen. And so um, the idea, before closing the gates of Flaming Gorge, is that if we poison the Green River in Wyoming, we can get rid of all these junk fish, so those native fish and then carp and some actual junk fish. Um, and if we do it just right, all of the poison will oxidize before it gets to the National Monument, and that makes it legal. <laughs> okay. So this is the drift lines. Um, this is a, it's you know basically this poison is not harmful to humans. Um, it makes it so that you can't do oxygen transfer through gills, so if you're an invertebrate um, or a fish, it's bad for you. And uh, people were just harvesting fish off the shores. I mean, the, the kill was massive. Um, I'm sorry, what was the point of that? What, was, what were they trying to accomplish by going in the river? Uh, make it work for a uh, <coughs> less trout fishery. Oh, I see. You just get rid of everything, get rid of everything and then switch out your stocks. Um, it didn't work. <laughs> uh, killed a lot of fish. But so here's the here's Green River, um, and they started the poisoning up here, and the idea was that they were going to clear out the river, and then uh, they got it past. You know, as long as it didn't poison in the monument, it would have been cool. But um, there's a number of problems with the '60s. Uh, one of them was TV, and um, you know that got on the air, and so uh, again, we um, agitate uh, nationally. So um, this is sort of the end of the big dam era. We did continue making dams into the 80s, uh, but we um, started changing the value system, and we uh, end up with that event along with um, 
Devil's Hole pupfish and a couple other the, the Cuyahoga River catching on fire for you know so the umpteenth time. These were a number of things that created a national outcry that we are obligated to other species, um, and we should we have a moral obligation and ethical obligation. So the last thing that we have is where we are now, and that's this present-day adaptive management, and it's jargony, but the Grand Canyon system is an adaptive management, and this is where we're actually running a river system, and we're managing a river system for ecological flows, for the aquatic life, for the terrestrial sphere, um, and this is where, this is modernity. Um, they're now going to, uh, Flaming Gorge has water releases, there's a lot of uh, aquatic insects at Flaming Gorge, there's not that many aquatic insects in the Grand Canyon section. So they're going to actually change the river flow to manage for insects so that they can have um, offspring and hopefully feed fish and then change the hydrologic regime and so the raptors will be happy as well. So in adaptive management, we're talking about fish, we're talking about raptors, we're talking about building big beaches. It's exhausting. <laughs> if you ever want to take a really depressing class, might I suggest conservation of natural resources that teach it every fall? <laughs> Everybody is super bummed out by the end of it. <laughs> I'm an inspiration to the future. So I'm teaching a management of rivers class, and so I asked my students, um, what are they, how do they want to deal with the future? And so this is partially a list from them. Um, I don't really dictate what people take on, but um, my thoughts are we need some sort of new connection with the public if we're going to talk about our natural resources. This saving the, the world for our children is a kicking the can down the road philosophy where I think we should start thinking about we should save it for ourselves. If we were a little more selfish, then maybe um, we would come up with better strategies. Uh, rather than saying, well, my kid really seems to have this figured out right now. Um, so we're getting this weird connection with our landscapes and um, you know, public lands and public hands. John Wesley Powell knew that there was about 93 million acres of arable land um, with the water supply. That is pretty much what we're, uh, we have in agricultural production. That land that isn't an agricultural production, he feels should have been left in the public trust as part of, and that's kind of why the West has so much public lands. It, philosophically, uh, we're back to where he was thinking. Um, the dialogue of the aesthetic, um, uh, Edward Abbey probably was starting that, but there's a lot of issues with how he writes if you kind of go back and read that stuff. And the modern world is a little bit creepier than it used to be when I was younger. Um, 1872 mining law. It turns out, in, in the 100th anniversary of John Wesley Powell, nobody touched the mining law. Mining has primary water rights throughout the West. Not oil extraction or coal, but hard rock mining is numero uno in any sort of um, water usage out here. And there's, and, the, and there's no encouragement to be efficient in the water use. Um, the student of mine who uh, geology uh, major at Wyoming, um, he is he found the Clifton Morenci mine is one of the you know it's like five gallons of water per ton of uh, ore. I mean he like Morenci is doing a really good job as far as extracting, but then there's no other uh, motivation for other mines to be that efficient. Um, this law is. In, in water law right now, probably the strongest thing out there. Um, and then there's this new thing with oops, water transfers, where we're taking things out of agricultural production and into um, uh, cities. I don't think I have a slide for this, so I want to mention that one of the insane things about our water laws in the West, and I'm not a lawyer, so I can say whatever I want. I, I mean, I'm a college <laughs> professor, so you know, I, sky's the limit for me. Um, <laughs> our water laws are for mining and agriculture. We're the fastest growing region in the country. There is no town over 10,000 people on the Colorado River and Green River between Grand Junction 
and uh, Laughlin. Vernal, maybe. Sometimes. Vernal's over 10,000? It's right on the edge. So our water laws are made for those communities, but we have Phoenix and Las Vegas. So we're going to have to encounter some sort of uh, re-examination, and this is where I, I'm arguing that we need to be proactive about what you want the future to look like, because um, we have this arcane system and this new reality, and that's kind of uh, one of the dialogues that we're working on in our project. Um, we also have landscapes of conflict. Uh, this was the Esplanade uh, Confluence. Um, the Navajo Nation was talking about running a gondola to take 28,000 people down to the confluence of the Little Colorado River. Uh, the women, um, I got to meet the women who were arguing, you know, like, hey, that's our house, and you know, we have sheep here. Uh, this is spiritual. Don't do that. Um, they won. Uh, so this is currently off the table, um, which was a huge win. But then we have bear's ears, and if you go down there, um, there's a lot of oil um, uh, interest in that area, and we're still flip-flopping on that. So we're still in this landscape of conflict, <coughs> and the big question is, is there water down for the energy extraction that they're proposing in the bear's ears? Um, it's still our land. I mean, that's one of the things I think is lost in this dialogue. It's still federal land, and we don't know if there's water uh, for any of the activities that they're proposing down there. Um, that's something to stay tuned. So we're now, we're still in this sort of 1880s mentality of what should we use our water for. Um, the stuff that should start freaking us out though is that, um, this is a quote from Cape Town, does anybody know about? Uh, so four million people in Cape Town, all socioeconomic classes, is heading towards day zero, meaning that their water supply is out. Um, food grows where water flows, and this is the, I, I just thought this was the coolest quote. What we didn't know is when the future would arrive. And this is the problem that we have in the West. Powell warned us that there would be a future of conflict if we didn't deal with water properly. And it was easy back then. It's super complicated now. Um, we depend on our mountains to supply our water. Uh, this is, you know, we think of the water towers of the West. Wyoming, we're, um, we're a major supplier to Western water supplies. That and the uh, rim of the, uh, the uh, ridge line of Colorado. 50% of the water in the Colorado system is at the first gauging station. So it's very much in the headwaters. Um, if we alter this, uh, we're in trouble. Um, and this day zero conundrum, um, this just came out, so I just threw this in just to kind of give you a sense. They're now going, there's an organization that is monitoring 500,000 dams around the world to look at their water levels. We know the Colorado River system is at 50% capacity right now. Um, Cape Town, 4 million people. Morocco, 700,000 people, it's a small country. Um, in the Indian states of Madaha, Parish, and Gujarat, 30 million people, water supply is vulnerable. Uh, Iraq. Thousand, thousand or million? 30 million, sorry. Oh, Morocco. Morocco. Oh, Morocco. That's, uh, sorry, that's 700,000. Sorry, oh. thanks. <laughs> we'll fix that for the tape uh, edit. Um, Spain and Portugal are um, highly vulnerable in their water supply. So this is coming to us. And, uh, and um, I don't know what we'll do. Uh, when uh, Phoenix, when Arizona just, well, when the, we just resolved the issue with Mexico on uh, storing Mexico's water in the Colorado River, the editorials in Phoenix were, were really happy because we don't want it to look like we're running out of water. <laughs> so they know they're, they're running out of water, but as long as the appearances are good, we're okay. It's a mirage. <laughs> so, and this is just sort of uh, data, um, surface area of water. Uh, so this is Morocco. Um, here's India. Uh, Mosul. Actually, I was watching, I'm still waiting for that dam to just break because nobody's maintaining it. Um, 
And so, you know, we are going to start facing these um, conflicts. So, I'm mid-career. I'm not sick. Usually mid-career people who get sick start thinking about caring about the planet. Um, I've always been worried about water. Actually, I have this vision that, you know, everybody in Tucson just disappears and I have, you know, gutters on, you know, subdivisions and that's my water supply. My wife is not too keen on that idea, but I think it would be kind of fun. Um, just mainly because mainly of the plumbing situation. Um, so what we're trying to do, uh, we're, we have a, uh, a relatively large project. Oh, I'm talking long. Um, Thanks. I feel much better now. Um, we developed this project, you know, based on, well, let's see what Powell would have done if we had followed his original plan. Then we decided we were on his plan. And so the next step is the future is the great unknown. We really don't know. We don't know when the future is going to arrive for us. Um, I study long-term environmental change. I know that the rivers in Wyoming have been uh, ephemeral for prolonged periods of time, you know, in the thousands of years scale. That's my specialty. Um, so to think of the North Platte River not flowing for, you know, a thousand years, you know, a couple good years, that would be kind of, uh, it's an interesting world that I operate in. So, what, when will the future arrive? Big drought is completely reasonable to me. Um, we have lawyers working on the purposes of the law of the river related to contemporary uh, social ecological systems. We're moving people into the cities. People are not um, <coughs> relating with the land. Microgreens come from Yuma. Um, doesn't affect us as long as we live in Phoenix. Uh, again, uh, well, just so I didn't say this, but if you're from Arizona, nobody likes Phoenix. So I like to pick on them. Um, notice that my degrees are Flagstaff and Tucson. Um, <laughs> what challenge of service in response to the intent of resource manipulation in the West? Um, how does the Colorado River inform society's sense of place? Um, and what's the relationship between our culture collectively and the Colorado River system? The Colorado River system feeds um, the entire country and a large part of the world. So what we're doing is approaching this legalistically, uh, humanistically, and artistically. Um, we know that we can make these conversations, you know, it's like that I get to talk to you is, is incredible. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, if we go national with this, we can go back to how we used to do it in the 1800s. Uh, Thomas Moran uh, was selling the West. He, he erased aspects of the landscape by uh, taking out the railroad. Uh, and uh, this is one of his sketches. Uh, his sketches are really cool. Uh, sometimes in the clouds, you'll see his notes on color, and that's how he makes the cloud swirls. Um, uh, we're going to have, hopefully, be showing some of this stuff uh, in uh, museums in Wyoming, uh, Index Peak, um, and you know, the Chasm of the Colorado. Uh, so this painting here is supposed to be the match to the one for Yellowstone, and Congress bought that as well. Uh, very famous paintings of Green River. <coughs> um, romantic, romantification, uh, romantic, the romance of the landscapes. And this is um, not necessarily man uh, selling Manifest Destiny, but it is sort of saying that this is a beautiful place. Uh, the Grand Canyon National Park is coming up on its 100th anniversary next year as well. Um, so where we are in this project now is we're writing a book on um, values of landscape. Hopefully that will come out next year. And we've... Um, <coughs> We've also collected landscape uh, artists and this number of artists, and this is uh, the lead artist, Pat Patrick Kikut, Um and he's actually drawing art that uh, was done thousands of years ago, this uh, Fremont culture art. Um, and he said, wow, it's just really weird to 
be drawing somebody else's drawings that's so old. Um, but he's following in this Moran um, style, and so um, I've been running him down the river, um, and he's starting to do sketches very Moran-esque, getting a little essence of color and watercolor. Um, this is Drop Dollhouse in Canyonlands. Um, but his major work is not erasing the human off the landscape. Uh, so uh, plastic teepee or uh, plastic jeep and teepee, um, and he's uh, and so he's the lead artist, and he's going to uh, when we do the expedition, which I'll tell you about in a second, uh, he'll be on the entire uh, re examination of the Colorado River system, uh, doing field drawings and oil paintings as we go down the stream. Uh, we also have print artist Kate Atchison. She um, is doing wood walks. She's, um, she has a wood print off of a drift boat. That's the entire San Juan drainage. It's a beautiful piece. Um, again, trying to let people know that these landscapes are important and they're still beautiful even though um, we're using them quite a bit. Uh, Brandon Gellis, um, he's going to have a show here in Jackson. Uh, he's been decomposing some of the uh, work that were in the, geolo the uh, monographs, the geologic monographs. Uh, Holmes's work, uh, that's a decomposed uh, landscape of the Canyonlands District. Um, um, David Jones is a sculptor, and he's actually interested in the usage of the landscape, um, industry, um, industry, Active industry, abandonment industry, homesteading, active homesteading abandonment, and he does weird things like makes scale models of trailers and then burns them. Uh, <laughs> that's the model burning. There's a real trailer for scale. Uh, there's videos of these, and so they're they're actually kind of fun installations. Um, Eric Osborne also following uh, the Moran aesthetic. So you have something like the Chasm of the Grand Canyon, but the tourist buses. Um, because one of the things that we need to recognize is that these are international landscapes at this point. They're our possession, but we do internationalize them. Um, and there is an aesthetic of the old and the new. Um, you know, appreciate, there, there's just, there is, uh, well, I like some of these things. Um, Bailey Russell is using old time, uh, he's going to try to do tin type photography, like uh, what Hiller did on the second expedition in Delmbaugh. Um, so we're going to attempt to do on river dark rooms and uh, 1800s photography. Um, that stuff blows up, so it's not going to be on my boat. Um, <laughs> There's a, there's a weird combination in 90 degrees. Um, and so, so we're, we're producing a book, uh, which you, know, you should all uh, buy. I'm not sure what charity it's going to go to, but it will go to a charity. Uh, there's three editors. Um, and we're having a distributed art show. Um, so next year, for the sesquicentennial, we are going to run the 1,000-mile trip that Powell did in, originally in 1869. Um, and incorporating the reservoirs. Uh, we have logistical things like dams to go around, so we're not gonna run those sections. But we're basically going to start a moving dialogue down <coughs> the Green River uh, to the Virgin River, starting in Sweetwater County, um, and we launch on May 24th, 2019. There'll be a week-long uh, set of talks and outreach events in Sweetwater County, and we're going to have a distributed art show with the artists um, in uh, four locations. Uh, the main ones are Sweetwater County Museum, the John Wesley Powell River History Museum in Green River, Utah, and the John Wesley Powell Museum in Page. And those artists will have pieces. So to see the whole show, there'll be like a little concert bill, it'll be like going to a Grateful Dead concert, but with art, uh, well, visual art. Uh, yeah, just, I'm gonna get out of that rabbit hole. Uh, but there'll be a concert bill, and so you could actually drive John Wesley Powell's trip down river and see expressions of place and uh, be a part of the dialogue. Um, we're also talking of um, having this on a story map so you could follow the expedition and see where we are and actually communicate with us. Um, 
there's other events related to the 150th anniversary. Just this is just in Wyoming. Um, uh, we have um, an event coming up. If you happen to be in Laramie on the 26th, free food. Um, a panel discussion of three of our authors. Uh, the book is covering water, public lands, and Native Americans are the three themes that we're looking at for our visioning of the future. Uh, we have um, 16 authors uh, working on material for us currently, and uh, their challenge, uh, they've been asked to look at John Wesley Powell's uh, technical writings, um, place that in context and contemporary, and then explore what they think the future should uh, might be. Um, if the future, if, if everything's good, I think that's a great answer as well. But if people are concerned, then maybe we should have some sort, of, you know, at least begin the dialogue. Um, Beerstadt, uh, the reason I mentioned him uh, in context of Moran, there's going to be a show of his work up in Cody. So Moran actually was a conservationist initially, and so was selling the West and this Manifest Destiny. Then he switched and go, moved over to the railroads, and the railroads were divesting themselves of a lot of land. And so he started commodifying the West, whereas Beerstadt was doing these sort of dragon fantasy paintings initially, and then um, became uh, more of an important voice for conservation in uh, the West. Uh, one of the artists, uh, Brandon Gellis, is going to have a show here um, in, in June. Um, and that's going to have some of those decomposed um, uh, 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 landscapes, uh, the uh, plexiglass of uh, homes. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to have the tin types up here. Um, and then we're going to have a number of events and uh, outreach events in Wyoming um, through the spring and fall of next year. We launch on May 24th because that's when Powell launched. And we're going to run 1,000 miles. Um, it'll be 90 days. And there will be a conference at the end of all of that in Flagstaff uh, where all the authors will present their material and um, I'm going to get a shave. <laughs> um, the goals of our project uh, is really to um, create a dialogue that hopefully uh, benefits the future or at least puts a stamp that says, you know, we thought about this. All the material that we're going to produce will be archived either at the American Heritage Center in Laramie or at the Nevada Museum of Art. Um, so uh, we are trying to put a stamp on history that uh, you know um, some idiots in Wyoming thought, you know, maybe we should talk about this. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm kind of aiming for obscurity in this. I, I keep being voiced up front. But um, yeah. So it's NPR week. Um, I don't know if this will. Um, I was going to show you a video that basically says go to our website. If you'd like to donate, you're welcome to. Um, but we do have a video and a website. I have stickers for free as well in the back. But one of the weird things about this project, just to kind of, uh, this is the unexpected for me. Um, this was sent to me last night. Uh, this is uh, David Clark's um, sculpture uh, that's at, Green, at the Sweetwater County Museum in Green River. Um, he said, hey, I hear you're giving this talk. Uh, feel free to use this photo. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things about this entire project is how many people are emerging uh, from all over the place that are talking about that this is something, this is a dialogue that they feel is important. Um, I've gotten three slideshows and a daily diary of somebody who's done the thousand mile journey before uh, these 1940s Kodachrome or 1950s Kodachrome photos of rafts, which are super scary, 
um, because they don't really have good light jackets. Um, uh, our trip is not going to be a reenactment. We're going to have a lot of equipment. We are going to eat food. Um, and so, so the reason that I was going to show you the video and ask you to donate is because it turns out food is really expensive these days. Uh, John was the that his first event trip for $10,000, and I think that's kind of scale for inflation for us. Um, this is our project. That's who I am. I'm Tom Minkley, um, and I really appreciate you all listening, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions that I know the answer to. Uh, but I have a PhD, so I'll answer anything. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. 
Hi. Um, a, a couple points, and I won't go into too much detail because I could go on forever. Um, one thing is, if you want to say that Wyoming will have water forever, um, think about climate change. Mm -hmm. Think about the form that precipitation is coming in, and remember that our our water depends on snowpack, and that if our precipitation comes in the form of rain instead of snow, then we may not have, be in such a good situation down the line, and we may have less recharge to our groundwater systems, and we may not have long, good base flows that we have currently. Also think about the magnitude and frequency of storms that come in, and that may change as well. And that does argue for impoundment, because then we can manage the system and capture it in, in, at the headwaters when those rains come. Um, there are other arguments against impoundment. Yeah. Water that goes downstream is not a lot, is not wasted. Yes. I'm a geomorphologist and a hydrologist. Water that goes downstream is not wasted. Right. In-stream flows are a good thing. They help maintain channels. They help with connectivity for all kinds of species, macroinvertebrates, fisheries. They help channel form and function. We need flooding to maintain channel function. Yeah. So there's lots of different things to consider. And please, you know, this is my opinion, personal opinion, professional opinion as a hydrologist. Water that goes downstream and leaves the state is not wasted. I, I completely agree, but I, uh, yeah. Colorado cutthroat trout are not a waste. Yeah. It's, uh, it's what hat you wear in, the, in any question. Um, I'm a habitatist, so I think that we maintain habitats. Yeah. But if we're asking about you know, strictly management, that's why I show the, you know, this is what we can do, mm -hmm. and it's not a way that you should run a river, yeah. um, but it is a way you could. Yeah. And that's where we were. Uh, we're not at that point anymore. Yeah. We are much more in an adaptive management yeah. and thinking about those environmental flows. Yeah. Um, but realize, too, that Lake Mead has gone down, what, 30, 40 feet recently? Yeah. So well, they, and those reservoirs are not going to maintain their same level forever if hydrologic conditions in the basin change. And then there's the fill me first, um, right. which would be to drain Lake Powell. But there, uh, yeah. there's a lot of issues with that yeah. because um, the most you can flood, uh, the most you could release out of Glen Canyon Dam is 47,000 cubic feet per second. Mm -hmm. And then once it goes below the power plant, you can only release 5,000 feet per second. And so then all of a sudden you've changed the entire flood regime and then you have to drill holes in to drain the rest of the lake and at max you're still only looking at floods of about 45,000 cubic feet per second. And the spring floods used to be 180,000 cubic feet per second. So, so it's so complicated. Anyways, I'll so let somebody really else go. It's really complicated. And I, I agree, but yeah. you know, it's, I'll let somebody else go. Um, my, what I'm trying to do is I, I like to throw out firebrands. Uh -huh and create a conversation because, you know, my job is really to just counter everybody's argument. That's kind of what I like to do and just sort of like, well, what happens if you think about it this way? And that's not necessarily comfortable. Um, you know, I'm not comfortable doing it, but it's kind of what I've done for, you know, 15 years. There was a question up front. Yeah. Would you say a thousand year drought? Yes. And like California's had like, Yeah, but agricultural profits have gone up in California. So you have a million people in California who are water insecure, yet agriculture uh, profits have gone up. So this is this weird thing. We have to be very sure we know what drought we're talking about. Now, an ecological drought, so I work on ecological droughts. So a thousand year drought to me is that the forest is fine. Well, I'm not a tree. Um, Five-year drought can really affect social systems, and so this is the, that's where our vulnerability is. Is like, okay, are you uncomfortable because you can't wash your car, or are you uncomfortable because you can't eat, or um, there's no water coming out of your tap, and that that's a different vulnerability. And that's actually, you know, I, I kind of smirk a lot, but that's actually the stuff that you would be really concerned about, and that's what California has experienced, where complete communities do not have water. That's this day zero. We don't know when that future will come. Um, we know that when you 
stress social systems, weird things happen. I was talking to a friend of mine who lived in Puerto Rico, and one of the things that happened with the hurricane that you wouldn't think about is that there's no electricity. There's everything's a cash economy. So he had employees, and yeah, you know, he's like, okay, well, we have to pay our employees because we don't want them to not get paid, even though they can't work. So now we have to find security, and you have to walk out with cash. And so that's something that we don't expect. So we don't know how um, not having water will affect us socially. Uh, that's why that's why Cape Town is uh, interesting in that it's showing a very specific vulnerability across all social classes, and those with means are actually buying think weird things like shirts for those you know uh, people who are trying to help elderly with water, you know, to show that they're okay and they're not going to rob you. Yeah, this is um, climate change has come to us and it's going to come to us through, uh, re regardless of causation, it's going to come through us in a social way. So my research is at the ecological level. This social stuff is um, much more intimidating. Okay, well, for California, there are an awful lot of crops mm -hmm. that drink mm -hmm. much more water than other crops, like almonds that you yes. mentioned. And should we be supporting that? Maybe we should be supporting crops that don't drink all that water. I, I don't know how you, you manage that. It's the same thing like you're saying Phoenix. It keeps growing. Yeah. It's got so many people. Why should they allow that, that city to keep growing if they're going to run out of water fairly soon? Well, again, out of my specialty, but I would say that um, we our water management system in the West is a capitalist, is based on capitalism. And so capitalism has two things. You buy or you don't buy, and that's a capitalistic decision. So if you um, palm, you know, that, that's a major contributor. Uh, so pomegranate juice, the palm company, the uh, happy, the pistachios, you know, all these weird commercials that, you know, we used to not really care about pistachios that much, but now they're really kind of fun and they're green. Um, almonds, almond milk is really important. Um, that was a marketing campaign, that's capitalism, and you can choose to not do that. Um, and that is a strategy that is powerful. But I, I, I'd be remiss to tell you what to do and not to do. We have time for one more question. So. Um, I was wondering if the firebrand that you're throwing out is, let's go back to pre-1811 and get rid of water management. Mm, no. <laughs> Where do I land? Yeah. I don't want to tell you that. Um, I think we really need to I think that we have developed a system that is currently incredibly vulnerable and needs change, and it's the architecture of the system, physically, you know, the infrastructure of it, and um, and the legal framework is is aging in a way that is increasing our vulnerability, and if we're going to be reactive, it's going to cost us a lot of money. And since it's working, this would be a great time to think of a new system. Um, but our challenge is that we uh, keep, sometimes we keep bad components of an old system. So I think that we need to just sort of start thinking logically about, um, we don't, agriculture can be more efficient, mining can be more efficient. Um, so that, you know, so let's just use 1872 mining law. If we make mine, hard rock mining a little more efficient water-wise, that can give us maybe a half million acre feet um, in the West. That could buy us some years. That's a start. But we have to go through this systematically. And this is where, um, this is why I, I, I really like John Wesley Powell. He was trying to get ahead of this game. So um, when we were developing irrigation districts in the West, he, Congress passed a law that says that people can't settle if there's going to be inundated. And John Wesley Powell said, 
let's go mapping. Let's do science and identify those places. And so nobody can move to the west until we know where we're going to flood. That, that upsets people. And so South Dakota said, well, you're science, you, know, you don't know water in South Dakota. How is that different than water in Wyoming or Nebraska or wherever? It doesn't matter. So we have to break down the, you know, you can let the system collapse and you can let people literally die or you can get ahead of it. And what I'm arguing is we have to start the dialogue. So may, if it's going to take 25 years, if we don't start now, that's a year lost. And so that's kind of, that's, that's my impassioned plea is, you know, if you're good, you're good. And I'm, I'm good with that too. I, doing nothing is totally a strategy. So, uh, before, before, uh, before, okay, we're going to do the chair thing here, just like we do in the library. Uh, okay. Stack them on the side, stack them up there. Tomorrow, 12.15, show up a little bit early at the Senior Center. If you questions that you didn't get to ask tonight, you can probably buttonhole Tom as well. On behalf of the geologists of Jackson Hole, Tom, I want to thank you for thank you very the much. incredible presentation. Up. Okay. So, John, you can come up and ask your question. How well? Yeah, they're not doing the ball. They're speaking the whole year. Yeah. It's on YouTube. What is on YouTube? These are on YouTube. Is the old kid cool? Okay. Yeah. Elizabeth, I've got to get through here. Try to turn this thing off. Hi. What did you film me for? Uh, I'm a videographer of new career uh, for geologist Jackson Hole. And I video most of their presentation in the And then I put them on YouTube. Jackson Hole. So you can see tonight somewhere down the line? Yep. And you can see the last two or three years. Because so many times they're. Um, they're almost PhD work, you know, with, 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 I've been to a lot of them, and it's just like somebody wants to talk about the thesis or something, and I always thought, well, I'm not the only ones I missed. You can uh, sample them in the field. How nice, on YouTube. What are they going to be listed in? Geologists of Jackson Hole on YouTube. Okay. And, yeah, like the last one was this one. <laughs> Oh. It was so thick. I just lost my mind Oh, yeah. What? You can, in within my days, I'll put it up and you can do So, did you get it before oh, I called you? Yeah. Did you get it before I called you? Only because I saw the daily And, but it was so nice. And you know how to upload then, I guess. Uh -huh. It's kind of a, it's, it's a little time consuming and I need to get them off my computer because after a while it's a lot of Oh, it takes up a lot of space. A lot of memory. So that's my next goal is to get them onto a backup. I want to tell the Van Gendrens because Warren had a... Warren Van Gendron had a meeting here tonight before, that's why he came in late and sat in your seat. Um, he thought, oh, <laughs> an empty chair, because I know he'll... Although it sounded like it's going to be at the Senior Center tomorrow. Yes. Oh, and then... Yes. For and after. Well, the, pre the, pre yeah. oh. the presentation will start at 12.15 in order to get in there and get you yeah. food. Right. Because so usually they... They so should have said 12.15, should say, before 12 o'clock. Yeah. Because you have to go to the 
Well, he does what he should say. Oh. It's just the actual presentation. The presentation. I'll get my lunch first. Yeah. Home is young. I'll tell you, Jared is visiting with Elizabeth Keywell. Correct? You know? Yes. Correct. You know, we were in Ann Arbor at the same time. Oh, my goodness. And a few years, anyway, a few years ago, you can see all the challenges. I just learned that. Fabulous. Yeah. Not, from, from, not from the beginning of time, but for the last three years or yeah, so. that's right. Since she started taping. Yes. Thanks to you. I can't believe I've ever seen it seven, even though I know they started the Oh, so you miss? So did more. So I'll have to watch it. Yeah, I saw watch it come it on in. YouTube. Yep. Well, it will be in a couple days. I'll try to hurry. Oh, I just need to put things down here. If somebody take you somewhere. You spent on eBay. Thank you. Um, 